Welcome to GSG Music and the Ultimate Music Theory Level 7 Supplemental Workbook Teacher Presentation. You know, as I was preparing my presentation for you today, it reminded me of a story about a dad with twin six-year-old boys. Now, as any parent knows, riding the school bus is scary enough, but finding the way from the classroom to the bus all by yourself is even more intimidating. There's so many buses and they all look the same. Now, this dad said that his six-year-old twins spent most of the year getting comfortable with their exact routine and pickup point. And then one day, they were told their pickup spot was going to change. So you can imagine. In the days leading up to the big switch, it became evident that one of the twins was very concerned while the other seemed unaffected. The new pickup spot was just outside one boy's classroom, and he could see it from his window. But for the other boy in a different classroom, the pickup spot was farther away and in a different location and in a different direction. The night before, Dad told his nervous little boy that they were going to go on an imaginary journey. And Dad said, pretend you're in class and let's practice opening the door. Now, which way do you turn? walking down the hall, and then across the parking lot to the new pickup spot. Well, after several rehearsals, the young boy felt confident. And what Dad realized was, and as I did, was that people, and even children, aren't really afraid of change. What they're afraid of is not being prepared for the change, and I totally get that which is why I am here with you today to help you prepare for the changes that we are about to learn about and so that you can walk confidently down the hall <laughs> and into your successful teaching studio. I'm Glory St. Germain. I'm on the left. And together with Sheila mckibben Yuren, we've created the Ultimate Music Theory Program. And we're about to take a journey and learn new things. And we're not afraid of it. We're not afraid of change when we're prepared for the change. Am I right? Exactly. The change began in 2016 with the Royal Conservatory of Music Theory syllabus, which led us to build on the Ultimate Music Theory series and develop the UMT Supplemental Series. Now, Sheila and I love working with our UMT Dream Team, and I want to thank three Ultimate Music Theory certified teachers for their contributions to the Supplemental Series. In the front row, starting on the left, Julianne Workington, our Ultimate Piano Series composer, uh, in the middle, uh, Ruth Douglas, our Harmony History and Analysis Consultant. And on the far right, Joanne Barker, our Ultimate Music Theory Games Creator. Now, learning is about having fun doing what makes you happy. And as you can see, we have fun <laughs> doing what we do. We are happy to present the UMT program. Now, the UMT workbooks plus the UMT supplemental workbooks equal the RCM, Royal Conservatory of Music Theory levels. So far to date, we've covered Prep 1, used with the uh, Prep level, followed by Level 1. We've covered Prep 2, as used with Level 2, followed by Level 3. Basic, as used with Level 4, followed by Level 5. Intermediate, used with level seven, or sorry, used with level six. And today we're going to talk about level seven, which is what we're covering today. Then is the advanced rudiments used with level eight. And finally, the all-in-one complete rudiments workbook together with the all-in-one complete supplemental workbook. And this helps students prepare for nationally recognized theory exams, uh, including the RCM level eight theory exam and college entrance exams and so on. At Ultimate Music Theory, we take complicated concepts and we make it easy and we make it fun. <laughs> Here you see my students about to perform at the concert hall for the Musicians in the Making program. Now you've met most of them through this video series. I hope you remember them. In Level 7, uh, Level 7 begins with completing the Intermediate Rudiments Workbook uh, together with the level six supplemental workbook. And once both are completed together, then start level seven. 
Now, each UMT workbook has a matching cute little handy answer book that is identical to the workbook, making your te teaching life a whole lot easier. And I say that all the time because I am a teacher too. And it's saving you hours of time in marking and more effective time in the classroom, right? Now, you met Quinn in level six. He's the young man on the far right, and he's the one with the red hat. And he is going to be with us again today as we work through level seven. Today's Ultimate Music Theory Hat Tricks, you will learn three success tips for teaching level seven. Why we need them, how to use them, and done for you tricks. So if you are ready to get your hat on, you can leave me a little note in the chat and say, I'm ready. <laughs> I've got my hat and I'm ready. At UMT, we got you covered. And today is about level seven and what's new. Three hat tricks. Hat trick number one, why count intervals. Hat trick number two, how to finger play. And hat trick number three, tell a story. Plus, speaking of stories, a UMTC success story from a very inspiring Ultimate Music Theory certified teacher, Lee Ping Hudson, all the way from Virginia. I can't wait for you to meet her. The Level 7 Table of Contents itemizes the new concepts that are outlined in the comparison chart. And today you will be introduced to the root uh, quality and functional chord symbols melody writing with chord and non-chord tones, and Chopin's uh, revolutionary etude. And as an added bonus, each supplemental workbook includes a final theory exam. So here you see level seven theory exam is actually followed by a special certificate to recognize your student's successful completion of level seven. So um, we've got a great start for our level seven today. If you have your level seven workbook and answer book handy, you can follow along with the pages that we're covering today. The level seven comparison chart actually maps out the RCM level theory uh, concepts with the level seven supplemental workbook. So we've made it easy for you. And the supplemental workbook pages are indicated by a star as the new concepts are introduced in the 2016 theory syllabus. Now, we'll look today at um, the chords, we're looking at melody writing, and we're looking at music history. So let me ask you a question. Are you ready to have some fun? Because learning is all about having fun. So uh, if your answer is yes, <laughs> and I hope it is, just throw it in the chat box in our webinar today, then let's get our thinking caps on and learn three hat tricks for teaching level seven. The first of the three hat tricks for teaching level seven is count intervals. Intervals determine everything. They determine melody, direction, uh, they determine harmony, and they determine tonality. Now in level seven on page 28, you are learning about triads and the intervals that make up each three note chord. So. There we go, follow along with the arrows. <laughs> to determine the triad type or quality, first count intervals of a third and a fifth above the root. The type quality of the intervals determine the root quality chord symbol as major, minor, augmented, or diminished. Now using C as our root with different type quality intervals of a third and a fifth above the root, will change the sound of the triad. Does that make sense? Okay, good. I hope that was a yes, yes. Okay, good. <laughs> now let's listen as Quinn uses the hat trick of intervals to identify chords. He looks happy to be learning, doesn't he? So here's Quinn. Well, today we are learning the A, the very first hat trick. So and Tito are here, and so is Quinn. Hey, Quinn, how are you? Pretty good, how are you? Good, ready to learn the hat trick? Yeah. All right, let's check it out. So today we're talking about triads, and we're gonna learn our hat trick in a little bit, and that is learning about intervals. So go ahead and play that first triad. 
Okay, so what kind of a triad is that? It's a major triad. Major triad. So let's use our hat trick. Let's use the intervals. What are the intervals that create a major triad? There's a major third and a perfect fifth. Excellent. All right, let's check out the next one. Okay, so what kind of triad is that? A minor triad. Very good. And what are the intervals that create that minor triad? A minor third and another perfect fifth. Okay, can you play that a little louder for me, Quinn? Okay, so that's minor. All right, the next one, now we're gonna go back and say, what are the intervals? You have a minor third, and this time, what is the interval above that? A diminished fifth. Okay. Or, yeah. A diminished fifth, excellent. And that is now a diminished triad. So if we look at the intervals, we can determine the type of triad. All right, so let's go ahead and do the next one. Go back to major for a minute. Okay, what are the intervals for major? major third and perfect fifth. Okay, and so now in order to create an uh, augmented triad, what are you changing? I'm making the perfect fifth into an augment, uh, augmented fifth. Yeah, it's hard to say. <laughs> <laughs> augmented fifth. Ooh, that sounds kind of weird. <laughs> All right, so now let's do one more major triad. Okay, and in the very last one, we change from being just a triad, a three note triad, to a four note chord. What is the note that you're adding out on top of that major triad? I'm adding B flat. B flat. Okay, and now that becomes a dominant seventh chord. What are the intervals for that one? Uh, major third, perfect fifth, and minor seventh. Minor seventh. Okay, where do you get that B flat from? Because it's a dominant seventh. C is the dominant of F. Okay. And then F major it has a B flat. In there. Excellent. Good job. All right. So now let's go ahead and write in our root quality chord symbols. All right. So go ahead and play that first one for us. Okay. What is the root quality chord symbol for that one? It's just C. Just C. All right. Next one. So it's C minor. C minor. Very good. Next one. C diminished. C diminished. Now here's a little hat trick for you. When you want to think about what is that symbol, if you look at the word diminished and how we've spelt it on there is we've actually used little circles for our I dots, didn't we, Quinn? Yeah. So that kind of helps you remember diminished. So little circles for diminished sign. Okay, and the next one would be? Augmented. Augmented. I like what you came up with here, Quinn. So how do you remember that little plus sign for augmented? You could use the tall T in augmented. Excellent. The tall T in augmented. Tall T, that's a good one. <laughs> and then finally, the dominant seventh. Very good. And that's kind of easy to remember the seven because it's right in that dominant seventh chord, isn't it? Yeah. Great job. So we've got our root quality chord symbols above. We've learned about major, minor, diminished, augmented, and dominant seventh chords. So now we're going to use our hat trick of using intervals to determine our triads and our four note chord to uh, go ahead and learn about inversions. Level seven, page 32. The root quality chord symbols identify the root, the quality, and the lowest note. The slash equals an inversion. So that's what that means. Functional chord symbols identify the root, the quality, and the scale degree. So there's two different things. Root quality chord symbols written above the staff and the functional chord symbols written below the staff. Open your Level 7 Supplemental Workbook to page 32. Now, I want you to watch Quinn complete exercise number one. And if you have your whiteboard handy, just grab that really quick. You may want to complete this exercise right along with him as well. So here's Quinn. We're on page 32. Well, we're back with Quinn. He's finished uh, Intermediate Rudiments and Level 6 Supplemental. And now Mr. Quinn is ready for Level 7. Yay! <laughs> All right, let's open that up, Quinn, to page 32. And let's check out what we are learning about today. Wow. So today, we're going to be talking about our um, 
exercises on page 32. So now what does Sola have to say about all this? She says, wow, all that information from just a few symbols. Exactly. That's just a couple of symbols. That is a lot of information. So the exercise we're doing on question number one, we're going to do this on the whiteboard first, Quinn. So it says, using the information in the root quality chord symbol and the functional chord symbol, so you got to be a little detective here, identify the root and the scale degree name. All right, then the type quality, position, and the minor key. All right, so we're only going to do question number one, just part A. So let's go ahead and start with part A. So the first one, the uh, root quality chord symbol says G, M, slash D, and then uh, the functional chord symbol is 164. So let's start, Quinn. What is the root of that? The root is G. G, okay. And then what is the degree name of that? The degree is tonic. Okay. Right here. Very good. Okay, so now what is the type or quality? It is minor. How do you know that? Uh, well, there's the lowercase i and also the m at the top here. Very good. Okay, so type is minor. Excellent. So now we want to determine the position. Um, so if you were playing that with your left hand, what would the notes be? It'd be G, B, and D. Very good. Okay, so let's determine the position. There's a slash there, so we know D is going to be at the bottom. So how are you going to figure that out? Well, it's G, B, and D, and then if we go root, first, second, mm -hmm. the D lines up with a second. Excellent. So it has to be in second inversion. Second inversion is correct. All right, and now we have to determine the key. So it says you're doing the tonic of G minor. So what will the key be? G minor. G minor, that's kind of an easy one. <laughs> Great job. All right, so now it gets a little trickier. So the next one says B slash D sharp, and then it's a five, uh, six chord. So let's do the first one. So who is the root? B. B, okay. All right, and then what is the type? The type is minor, oh, major. Major, how do you know that? Uh, because there's no M at the top. Correct. So we've got major. Now it's a slash, and a slash tells us that it must be an uh, inversion. Yeah. Okay, so now go ahead and determine the position there. Now there's B, D, and F, and D has to be on the bottom, and that lines up with first inversion. Okay, excellent. And now let's determine the key. The key has to be, well, B is the fifth, so it has to be B, A, G, F, E minor. Right, E minor. Remember, always use lowercase letters to identify E minor and mo small m on minor. All right. Next one. So now we're looking at E sharp and there's a little circle there. What does that little circle indicate after the E sharp in the next measure? That means diminished. Diminished. Okay. So uh, who is the root? Uh, e sharp. Right. And now what is the degree? Oh, we should go back and finish B. Sorry. What is the degree for that five chord? And that is dominant. Dominant. Sorry about that. Very good. So now we've got E sharp, and it says it's the seven chord. So what is going to be our technical degree name for that? The leading tone. Leading tone, okay. And now we've got E sharp diminished, and now it's asking for the uh, type quality. Well, we kind of answered that question already, didn't we? Yeah. So if it has the little zero, that indicates what? That it's diminished. A diminished chord, and we figured that out at the piano earlier today. Okay, and then finally, we want to know what position is that in? Mm, so that E is, sharp is in what position? Uh, root position. Correct, because? Because there's no, uh, there's no slash for there's no another. Sl okay, excellent, so root position. And now we just need to determine the key. So you can use the keyboard um, on uh, the whiteboard here. So if you see uh, E sharp, just point to the E sharp on the keyboard. Okay, Same so thing. now we know that's the leading tone. And if you go up a half step, what note are you on? 
on F sharp. F sharp. So what is the key for this one? It's F sharp minor. F sharp minor. Very good. And then finally, the last one, what is the root here? Uh, F. F is the root. And what is the uh, degree name? Degree name is the median. Correct. Now, what is the type or quality of this chord? Uh, it's augmented, augmented by the little plus. Sign. Little plus sign, okay, augmented. And augmented means it's a major third and an augmented fifth. We did that earlier today as well. Okay, now it says the position. Um, to find the position, there's, in root position, it would be F, A, and C. Mm -hmm. And since C is on the bottom, it goes root first second so it's second inversion second inversion very good and so now we notice that we have a c sharp there and that indicates that it's going to be what is the key now we're going to have to start with f and go where uh, up or down go three down okay so it's f e d d okay what key are you in d minor d minor excellent Good job on that, Quinn. Now you're ready to put that all down in your workbook and uh, get her done. Let's use the hat trick, count intervals, to help us understand the functional chord symbols. So, for example, the functional chord symbol of the dominant chord is indicated by the Roman numeral uh, V, which is 5. And the added figured base, the small number after the Roman numeral, indicates the intervals above the root and determines the position of the triad. So now the dominant five chord in root position, so the root is the lowest note and the intervals above indicate the uh, five and then five, three. And usually that's just written as a five with no figured base. So that's the V, which equals five in Roman numerals. The dominant, which is the five chord in first inversion. So now the third is the lowest note and the intervals above indicate that it is a five, um, six, three, or just written as five, six, which means that's going to be in first inversion. And the dominant five chord uh, in second inversion. Now the fifth is the lowest note and the intervals above indicate the five, six, four. Now there is no abbreviation for second inversion. So root position is just identified as five. First inversion is written as five with the um, six as the um, additional little uh, figured base. And then the dominant uh, five chord in second inversion is written as a five, six, four chord. Here's how easy it is to understand and identify the functional chord symbols when you use the hat trick to count intervals. So watch Quinn in action as he uses the hat trick to count intervals. So we're using the first A hat now, the red hat, which is for our uh, our little uh, our little hat trick, and that is using intervals. Are you ready, Quinn? Yeah. Woo. <laughs> okay, cool. So I see you've completed your answer. You did a great job. So now let's use that hat trick, our intervals, in order to identify the position. So when you see the six four, show me the intervals, Quinn. Oh. Six is to show six above the bottom note, so this is an interval of a six. Okay. And here, it's just an interval of a fourth. Excellent. And so that tells us that it's a six four, which is in second inversion. Okay, let's do the next one. What are the intervals? That's our hat trick, is always use intervals to identify the position. Go ahead and mark your intervals. What are they? This one only says six, but technically, it could also be written as a six three. Excellent. Like that. Beautiful. Okay, so that one is always in first inversion. Next one. This one doesn't have anything, but could also be written right. as 5-3. Correct. Okay, go ahead and mark your intervals there. So your intervals are? 5 and 3. 5 and 3. Beautiful. And the last one? The last one is another 6-4, which is second inversion. Just interval of 6 and 4. 
six and four. Excellent. You did a great job. Does it make any noise when you put it back on, Quinn? I want to take it off again. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Great hat trick, Quinn. Yay. Can you see how this step-by-step -step system makes it really clear to, and easy to understand these concepts? Right? Does that make sense? Good. The second hat trick for teaching level seven is finger play. I know you're really curious, right? <laughs> what are you talking about, Glory? What is finger play? You can, I'm sure you're just kind of wiggling your fingers in anticipation of what in the world this is going to be about. But first, let's start by looking at level seven, page 52. So flip over to page 52. Non-chord tones. When writing a melody, the harmonic line outlining the simple progression of chords can be made more interesting by using different techniques. So melodic decoration is adding non-chord tones, such as a decorative passing tone known as PT, or neighbor tone, identified as NT, auxiliary note, to embellish the basic melody. Now, a passing tone, PT, is a non-chord tone moving by step, so same direction, as a bridge connecting two chord tones. A neighbor tone, NT, is a non-chord tone moving by step up or down as a bump adjacent to a returning chord tone. Does that make sense? Okay. So what does that have to do with finger play, you may ask me? Well, it looks like <laughs> Quinn is taking his finger to play with his hat. And no, that was not the hat trick that I was talking about. Haha. <laughs> Now, as you know, students just make up their own ideas when you're teaching, right? Think about what your student would do with that hat, you know? And actually, I didn't ask Quinn to do any of his little fancy tricks. This is all his own thing. <laughs> so let's see what Quinn is up to now. Well, there's Quinn. He's practicing his hat trick. How's it going with the hat trick? It's fun. <laughs> All right. Well, that was cute. I know you've been practicing that all week, Quinn. <laughs> Just a little bit. Yeah. So what are we doing for a hat trick here? Looks like there's a party going on. I see Tito's got something happening here and he's got some uh, melodic decoration going on. So we are talking about passing tones and neighbor tones. So can you just go ahead and uh, read that little Tito tip there for me, Quinn? Tito says... Unaxed non-chord tones fall on the weak beat or weak subdivision of the beat. When adding neighbor tones, there will be more than one correct answer, above or below. Right, so a passing tone moves from one chord tone to the next, either ascending or descending in the same direction. And a passing tone, uh, sorry, a neighbor tone can be up or down between two repeated chord tones. So go ahead and play the first exercise, Quinn. So question number 1A, uh, what key are you in here? Or in F major. F major, three, four times. So go ahead and just play that um, not too fast because we're going to be adding some chords in a minute. So go ahead and play that for us. Excellent. So now I'm going to have you uh, do a little finger play. Well, it's time to reveal the real hat trick of finger play. Now this hat trick actually comes from Ruth Douglas. She shared with me that when you're learning how to hear what you see, a great way to start is by using your fingers to play the piece on your imaginary keyboard on your desk or tabletop and learn how to listen to your inner hearing. Now this takes some practice, but it is very effective and it's lots of fun. So right now, take your fingers, and play the melody in uh, line number one on your imaginary keyboard just in front of you on the table. You may even want to hum along with it as you play. So get your hand in the right position so your thumb is, is going to start on the F. Can you hear the intervals in your head a little? Okay. 
Have you tried this technique with your students? I'd love it if you just throw me a little message in the chat box here. If you use this um, finger play technique with your students, I'd love your comments. It's just really interesting what we can do. Now in the next line down here that's blank, this exercise indicates that you're going to rewrite the melody adding melodic decoration using unaccented non-chord tones. And after completing that, you will then circle and label the non-chord tones as PT or as NT. Watch Quinn as he uses the hat trick of finger play. Check it out. So we've got a hat trick here, Quinn, and the hat trick is this. When you're doing your homework or uh, doing an exam and this exercise is to be completed, we don't always have access to a piano. So the hat trick is that we want to do finger play. And finger play is when we play that silently. So now I want you to work your magic and you're going to add your passing tone and neighbor tone and play that silently uh, on top of the piano. So you're just going to kind of tap it out with your fingers. Let's see what that sounds like. So you're going to do the same exercise. We're doing exercise number one uh, and you can go ahead and add those. Are you ready, Quinn? Yeah. All right. Now that you've practiced that, could you hear that in your head? Yeah. Yeah, I could hear it too. I think you did a good job on your hat trick there, Quinn. Are you ready to go on to the next thing? Do you think? Yeah. Really? Yeah. I Can you so. spin that thing any faster? Apparently not. <laughs> the third hat trick is to tell a story. You know, when I was first learning music history as a young student, I was given a book with facts about composers, their works, and told to memorize it. I mean, how boring and unmemorable is that? No wonder I had to start all over again when I started writing about music history and doing all the research in writing the history section in the supplemental series. So we took a different approach to music history, and that is tell a story. Remember the story I told you about the dad and his twin boys, how one boy was nervous about finding his new route, and, and what the dad realized was that the boy wasn't really afraid of change, but he was afraid of not being prepared for the change. So stories really appear to all types of learners. Storytelling has aspects that work for all three types of learners. A visual learner learns best from videos, diagrams, or illustrations, and they appreciate the mental pictures of storytelling. An auditory learner learns best through lectures and discussions, and they focus on the words and the storyteller's voice, as you might be listening to me. A kinesthetic learner learns best by doing, uh, experiencing or feeling and they remember the emotional connections and feelings from the story. Do you know your own learning style? Are you visual, auditory or kinesthetic? You can enter that in the chat box and some of you may not know and that's okay and you may also be a combination of more than one but not only do you need to know your learning style um, just as importantly you need to know the learning style of your student. Think about how you received the story about the nervous young boy who was afraid of not finding the new route to his bus. How did you relate to him? Visual, auditory, or kinesthetic? Storytelling is simple and it's really easy to remember. One of the composers in level 7 on page 66 is Chopin. The story of Chopin uh, comes from the Romantic era. Chopin, born in 19, or sorry, 1900, no, <laughs> Chopin, born in 1810 in Warsaw, Poland, was known as the poet of the piano. In 1830, Russians captured Warsaw in a revolutionary uprising. And this threw Chopin into a rage. He never forgave Russia. And he never played in Russia. 
Instead, Chopin expressed his devoted love, support, and patriotism for Poland through his music, including the etude in C minor, known as the Revolutionary Etude. Now, the story continues as students learn about music nationalism, about his concert etudes that were written for the virtuoso performer, his use of rubato and chromaticism. The story of the revolutionary etude is very dramatic. Now, as we tell the story about Chopin's revolutionary etude, uh, we learn about Chopin's ability to inspire performers to play with expressive phrasing and beautiful tone and dramatic expression and lyricism. Now, we simply go to GSG Music for easy resources to listening to Chopin's revolutionary etude. And in the Level 7 Answer Book, page 66, you can see how students complete their answers while they're listening to the music. And this kind of brings it all together. Does that make sense? Okay. As we use the hat trick and tell a story, we can easily remember Chopin's etude in C minor. The performing forces of the piano, the genre of solo piano, and the ternary form, A, B, A, 1. Now, in the section A, uh, which is very cool, the introduction begins with a crash of the first dramatic chord of indignation, anger, provoked by what is perceived as unfair, a dominant seventh chord that creates tension. This is followed by the descending swirl of legatissimo 16th notes, symbolizing resentment and despair. Now, after reading the story of Chopin's revolutionary etude, it's really exciting to listen to the etude and hear how Chopin expressed his feelings through the music. When you go to GSG Music or ultimatemusictheory.com, same thing, simply click on the free resources at the top of the page and then scroll down to find level seven and then click on view page. And this is where you're going to see all the videos uh, and everything all set up for you. This is done for you. Um, there's, there's just a, a, a huge amount of resource and hours and hours of time to uh, create all of this. And as I was preparing this for my own knowledge, I realized that I must share it with you because it's a lot of work and I know you're really going to be um, happy that it's all there for you and also for your students. You're welcome to send them to the page too. It's a free resource for teachers and students. When we tell a story, it is much more meaningful than just studying history and memorizing facts. So tell a story about Chopin's revolutionary etude. You can listen to the etude at the piano. You can see the score and watch the performer's hands. And you can experience the emotions of the performers in the orchestra as they present this piano etude in a completely different way. And you're going to see a little bit of that. It's quite amazing. So Lantito have got their UMT hat trick and are ready to share their story with Quinn. So let's listen in. Well, I see that uh, Sol and Tito have got the last hat trick happening there. So, uh, Quinn, what's going on? Who are we studying? Who's composer of the day? We're studying Chopin. Chopin. Okay. So, Chopin, I think we have chosen today is the etude, his revolutionary etude, which is pretty crazy in ternary form. So, tell me a little bit about Chopin. What's all going on with him? Well, when he was writing his revolutionary etude... It was written in C minor, which is referred to the stormiest key of all. Ooh. <laughs> Reflected, it was reflecting on Poland's failure in its rebellion against Russia. Understanding the sense of the conflict and struggle is essential to interpretation and the performance of the music as Chopin had intended. Absolutely. We can't really play a piece 
really deeply unless we understand what exactly was tormenting him, yeah. right? And so why do we need to study about all of this? Well, the reason we study music history is so we can understand his story. Ooh, good one, Quinn. <laughs> so let's uh, let's have a listen to uh, Chopin's uh, revolutionary tune. What have you got up first under our free resources today? Who are we listening to first, Quinn? This is... The uh, uh, first one is just a solo performer on the piano, correct? Yeah. All right, let's check it out. I'd like you to play that for me for next week. Maybe. <laughs> so now we've kind of seen the performance of it. What's uh, what's next? This one is kind of like a tutorial, I guess, with the the music sheet actually up above here. Oh, that's great. Let's have it. See how that goes. <laughs> And that's cool because we actually get to see how the hands move. Did you notice how there was a different tempo there, wasn't it? Yeah. Was it faster or slower? It was slower. It so was slower. Yeah. yeah, I think that they're just kind of take it easy. But that this piece is actually written for a virtuoso performer. I mean, you've got to be at that level in order to truly play that piece and master it, right, as it yeah. should be. We'll, we'll maybe work on that performance. Yeah. <laughs> that would be pretty cool. I, I mean, it's not that hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I'll just break it down in little pieces. Now, the last one that we're going to see, and, and I think the fun thing is that when we're listening to classical music, um, you know, in this day and age, um, things can be changed. We can use electronics. We can use vocals. We can incorporate uh, an orchestra. Originally, this piece, of course, is written for solo piano, right? That's the performing forces. Mm -hmm. But the next performance of Chopin's... Um, revolutionary etude is got a little more than just the piano in it right yeah. and completely different look to it so uh let's listen to our final performance of chopin's revolutionary etude in c minor that stormy key <laughs> gosh that is so cool i think i'll get you that outfit quinn <laughs> I, I think that would look really nice actually. <laughs> that's great well we've had a lot of fun today so we've enjoyed our hat tricks and uh, you're officially able to wear your hat now quinn you did a great job now you're ready to use the umt three hat tricks for musicians with your students in level seven use the hat trick count intervals when playing the game name that seventh chord use the hat trick finger play to play the sight reading piece on your imaginary keyboard on the table or uh, to learn how to hear what you see before sight reading your piece at the piano use the hat trick to tell a story to make your music history more interesting and memorable now, when students are writing their final exam at the end of Level 7 workbook, these questions will be easy as remembering, they're just as easy as just remembering the great story as you learned it. Haha! -ha. <laughs> yeah, I know, Quinn just makes you smile, doesn't he? You can't help but smile when you see that face. Quinn has got all three hat tricks, so let's have a final wrap up from Quinn. Well, we're saying bye to Quinn. <laughs> you did such a great job. He learned all three hat tricks, and he's going to be working on the Chopin, so stay tuned. Any last words, Quinn? I don't know. I'm just waiting to get that outfit. <laughs> That's perfect. Great job. I can hardly wait. Quinn's going to do it. Check it out on YouTube. Thanks, Quinn. 
teaching philosophy is a reflective statement of our beliefs about teaching and learning. UMT is about helping you teach with passion and enriching lives through music education. Our dedication to NEPD, Never Ending Professional Development, is not only for ourselves, but also for you by providing you with teaching materials, free resources, webinars, blogs, and our greatest gift of all, the Ultimate Music Theory Certification Course for Teachers. In the wise words of the late Jim Rohn, it is not what you do, it's what you become. It's the time we spend working on ourselves that leads us down the road to our greatest success. The Ultimate Music Theory Certification Course will give you the secret to envision what you want to learn, teach, and play. Engage in activities that excite you and enable learning. Empower you with successful teaching techniques. Simply go to ultimatemusictheorycourse.com for all the details and to get certified. You know that training and coaching can help you be more successful in both your personal and your professional life. Our UMTC success story is Lee Ping Hudson from Virginia. Her story is a success story. In fact, she inspires me. She's also a member of the UMT 100% Club, and we congratulate Ultimate Music Theory Certified Teacher Lee Ping on all her success. Here, in her own words, is Lee Ping to tell her story. Hello, my name is Lee Ping Hudson. I live in Centerville, Virginia. English is my third language, so please forgive my heavy accent English. I never thought that I would be teaching music theory because my music theory foundation is not at all solid. I purchased many other music theory books, um, but nothing makes sense, none of them makes sense for me. It was until two and a half years ago I came across Glory St. Germain's UMTC teacher certification courses. And at the moment I wasn't so sure that would work for me either because I tried so many other things, nothing worked out. So, um, but I, I pick up the phone and I, I spoke to Glory and she answered all my questions, addressed all my concerns. And it was through her passionate voice, her very positive energy, I knew that it was the right thing for me to do. So I jumped into the water, I purchased the course, I purchased all the material, I began to study. I found all the material in this Workbook, exercise are so clearly laid out, so wonderfully organized. It took me step by step, what I need to understand step by step. And I found myself be become a detective. I learned the skill to solve a mystery from unknown by taking the step to finding the answer. And it tried, it, it's something tried out over and over again. And I felt myself fell in love. I fell in love with UMTC courses. I watch the course, and then I do the exercise on the workbook. Frequently, I would sit up to one or two o'clock in the morning doing my exercise, watching Glory on the, the, the teacher certification courses. My husband said that I was addicted to UMT, and I said, yes, I am. And I'm proud of it. So uh, upon completing the basic rudiment, intermediate rudiment, advanced rudiment um, courses and complete all the exercise in the workbook. Now one good thing is about one of many good things about UMT is after every lesson you have a review test. You can test your understanding, your comprehension about the theory, and you can check the answer through the uh, convenient and designed uh, matching answer book there. So we can find out, you know, where you have not, uh, you know, where you need to do more work. And then you can find the answer right away. Upon complete all from basic basic rudiment to advanced rudiment, I, I, I took the practice exam by UMT, which is designed by Sheila. 
and then after each of the book, I took the RCM examination for the level five, level six, and level eight. I scored 98, 99, and 98. So I knew at that moment that this worked for me. But I was wondering would it work for my student too. So I began teaching basic rudiment theory class. I began with five students. And they followed the step that I had taken. Doing the exercise, taking the practice exam, taking the RCM uh, exam, and they scored 94, 98, 100, 100, and 100. And I was blown away. I was blown away. I said, wow, it really worked. It really worked for my student. It worked for me. It worked for my student. And my student, you know, they actually tell me that, that the exam was so easy because they were so well prepared through all the, the classes, doing the exercise. And it was such, uh, you know, they're so proud to share with me. And I have, now I'm teaching the three theory classes. One group is working on the preparatory rudiment. Second group is on the basic rudiment. And I have another group is working on the intermediate rudiment. They are preparing to take the RCM exam this May. Throughout my process of learning and also my process of teaching, frequently I, come, I came across questions. And I would pick up the phone and I speak to Glory. And she's always there to answer my questions. And when I took my teacher certification exam, I submitted to Sheila, and Sheila grade my examination. And then she responded with such detailed feedback regarding my theory, regarding my um, learning style. So even though I have never met Glory or Sheila in person, but I felt that I have gained two friends from Canada. And uh, I'm just so grateful for this wonderful material that help me conquer my fear of music theory. They also help me uh, to be a better teacher, to be a better musician, to be a better musician. And I am able to share the knowledge of music theory with my students. And by watching them, I can see they are progressing beautifully and they also respond to this UMT method so, so positively. Right now, we're using the supplemental uh, workbook um, after the intermediate rudiment and also in uh, after the basic rudiment and one of the major compo component different from before is music writing and music history so during the class frequently when they uh, write some melody they are so eager they are also eager to line up and play on the piano to show it to to their friends and they love the music class so much frequently at the end of the class I say, it's time to go home. And they say, oh, do we have to go now? And um, as one of my young students, uh, he, he, he say, you know, when you are having fun, the time just zip by quickly. And I did not even need to say it. The students say it for me. So it just proved that the UNT material is so wonderfully designed. To do the workbook exercise is not a chore. It's a joy. All the things, once you learn it, you do not need to work hard to memorize it. It kind of internalizes in you. You understand, you follow the step, and then it will stay with you. Along the way, I became a detective of music theory. My students become music theory lovers. They become more confident as a musician. And just like riding a bicycle, once you learn it to figure out how to ride it, you always know how to write it. And the knowledge I learned through studying or teaching UMT music theory, it's just like riding a bicycle. Once I have it, the, once I have the skill, I always have it. I can always pull it out and use it. And I'm just so grateful for this wonderful, wonderful material design by Glory and, uh, you know, and, and Sheila and all their wonderful team. You know, there's a lot of hard work to put everything like this wonderful together and to share. And um, I, wanted to, I wanna say thank you, Glory, for this wonderful, wonderful work. And this whole set of materials, they worked for me. They worked for my student. And if you give it a try, it worked for you too. 
Shiva and Glory, they help my hand throughout the process. They will hold your hand throughout your learning process, throughout your teaching process. And I'm so glad I made the decision to jump into the course. And I hope you do the same thing. And I'm gonna borrow Glory's phrase, teach with passion and good luck. Thank you, Glory, for your wonderful work. We love you and T. <laughs> Thousands of music teachers have found massive success in their teaching as they use the proven step-by-step -step Ultimate Music Theory system. The Ultimate Music Theory Certification course is an online teacher training program that will elevate your professional development that you can study at your own tempo, in the comfort of your own home. There is no, and you have it for forever. The UMTC examiner, Sheila McKibben Uren, and I invite you to join the Ultimate Music Theory family and enroll today and get certified. We're here to support you in your learning, and we walk with you every step of the way, as Li Ping just shared with you. By providing you with the opportunity to continue your own professional development with the Ultimate Music Theory certification course, uh, we're here together with you. And we are always enriching lives through music education. In our next session, you will learn how to start the car. <laughs> UMT Level 8 Music Theory is as much fun as a road trip. You will learn the three simple steps to compose a contrasting period before you start the car. We'll map it out with the easy-to-navigate UMT Composing Roadmap. I'm excited, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you next time. As always, teach with passion.